According to the Bible, every single person on the earth was born into the middle of a war. This war is one that cannot typically be seen with the naked eye. Its existence is not broadcast on the evening news. Its reality is not even realized by the vast majority of the population. Yet this war has raged on since the very beginning. The first shot fired in this war had a devastating effect. When the serpent entered the garden and tempted the first man and woman to disobey God, falling into sin, and then death entered the world. Sometime after, as mankind began to multiply and cover the face of the earth, the first full assault on humanity was launched. In a way, you could describe it as an alien invasion. But these invaders did not come from some distant galaxy, from some far-off star system. Rather, they descended from right above, as together they conspired to abandon their assigned posts in the firmament, where the ether carried the light of their luminescence to the four corners of the earth. These Watcher Angels fell from their first estates that God had set for them, and they came down to Terra Firma, where they began a sort of colonization campaign. They sired the Nephilim, their hybrid abomination offspring, which began to ravage the land and feed upon men. They corrupted the genetics of not just humanity, but of animals and plants as well. Using the knowledge they had been given by God to perform their original tasks in the heavens, they proceeded to teach mankind all sorts of forbidden things in order to civilize them, to equip them in the building of cities, vast kingdoms, where these fallen angelic beings could rule as gods. The knowledge bestowed by these beings was presented as being the keys to humanity's path to enlightenment, the technological know-how that would eventually allow us to take our seats alongside them as gods. But of course, this was all a lie. This forbidden knowledge brought nothing but destruction, perversion, wickedness, and death. God, the Creator, finally became so grieved by the immensity of the wickedness on the earth and the corruption of his creation that he decided to wipe it all out and begin again, sparing one single family and the animals which God brought to ride out the waters with them. When the waters receded, the world had been cleansed from the evil that had almost wiped out humanity from the face of the earth. The great empires of the Watchers had been erased, their monuments and citadels shattered by earthquakes and buried by oceans. The angels who had conspired together against God were buried deep in the bowels of the earth, held there in the deepest darkness until the time of the final judgment of all things. The bodiless spirits of the giants, the Nephilim, were cursed to roam the earth, tortured by hunger and thirst that they could never satisfy forever longing to have bodies to inhabit once again. Satan's direct rule over the whole earth through his vassals, the fallen watchers, was over. But no sooner than the earth began to be filled once again with trees and plants and animals, and people began to spread out and fill it once again, did the enemy of mankind begin working, seeking to rebuild what God had destroyed. His beloved Atlantean Empire whose sole purpose was the enslavement and destruction of mankind. But it would be different this time around. No longer did the Fallen One have the ability to send his rebellious emissaries to the earth, to take wives and build cities and palaces where such self-declared deities could sit and rule directly over their subjects. No longer could they walk amongst men and be revered for their brilliance and stature. The satanic kingdoms that would be built after the Flood had to be done through the worship of now invisible deities, forced to orchestrate their rule through various systems of interdimensional communication. Since God had now bound them behind a spiritual veil, once again a spectrum of forbidden knowledge was disseminated amongst these newly reborn civilizations in order to facilitate the connection between these civilizations and their demonic benefactors. 
Thus, in the courts of all the human kings and leaders of these kingdoms, worked a host of occult priesthoods, sorcerers, mediums, astrologers, and practitioners of divination. The subjects of these pagan kingdoms would demonstrate their fealty to their false, fallen, invisible gods by sacrificing to idols, building them temples, having orgies and revelries and bacchanalia. The rebellion against God resumed in earnest after the flood, from the first failed attempt by Nimrod to build a tower into the heavens and storm the throne of God, through all the following kingdoms which were founded after the scattering from Babel. After God destroyed the Tower at Babel and confused the languages of mankind, paganism and occultism were gradually spread and developed throughout the world yet again, until once more the true God of heaven and earth chose to intervene, this time by setting apart a nation, a people, a kingdom to bear his name to all the others. from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, down through Moses, Aaron, and Joshua, judges like Samson and Gideon, kings like David and Solomon, prophets like Elijah, Samuel, and Daniel, on through the centuries and amidst the rise and fall of many demonic empires, the God of all creation revealed himself and began to reveal his plan to redeem humanity from their curse of sin and death and demonic oppression. Finally, from the humble town of Nazareth, a man stepped forward and revealed himself as the promised Messiah, the Son of God, the Word made flesh, and the one whose own sacrifice would once and for all destroy the curse and make it possible for men and women to be reborn through the Spirit of God, who would actually come and live within us as the new temple of God. And from that point on, the great spiritual war began to take on a rather new twist. For many centuries that followed, the truth of God began to advance upon the various territories of these demonic kingdoms, freeing people from the bondage they had been held in for generations. And for the first time since the Great Flood, large numbers of people began to truly understand who they had actually been in servitude to in these pagan kingdoms. Throughout stretches of Europe, Africa, and Asia, the truth of Jesus kept spreading, and people kept getting set free. The first tactic Satan brought against us was brute persecution. He used his puppet emperors of the Roman Empire to imprison, kill, and torture the first Christians. But somehow, this only wound up revealing the power of the gospel and the hope in eternity that it truly brought. And so faith in Jesus only spread, under the stage where the once unshakable Roman Empire began to crumble under its own heathen weight. Next, Satan tried a different approach, which in many ways proved more effective than the first. Instead of trying to crush the spread of faith in Jesus with the powers of empire, he would usurp it. From the time of Constantine onward, the enemy began a blasphemous campaign of rebranding many of his old demonic kingdoms and demonic occult priesthoods as now being Christianized. This way he could seduce the Christians with wealth, power, and earthly pleasures, and corrupt the Church of Christ from within. Pagan temples were repurposed as Christian churches. Pagan rites and rituals were reinvented as Christian ceremonies. The Roman Catholic Church slowly emerged as one of the most effective weapons against the Kingdom of God, while it mockingly carried out its activities in His name, a tactic which has no doubt given the devil no small measure of sacrilegious joy. Through this earthly institutional vessel, 
Satan was able to prevent scores of people from actually reading the scriptures for themselves and turn them instead back to the same bondage and darkness that the demonic systems had enforced before. Only now it was being done in the name of Jesus. Still, by the sheer grace of God, the truth endured, the gospel spread, and genuine faith in the Creator and Savior of mankind continued to grow. Satan continued to work furiously to regain control of the world of men by way of Catholic imperialism and eventually European colonialism, which because of the advent of unprecedented naval power began to conquer more and more of the world that was accessible by ocean. At the same time, however, the spread of imperialism all too often still brought with it the truth of the gospel, which opened the hearts and minds of the people to the true nature and identities of the pagan and shamanic religions they had traditionally held. The more Satan worked to tighten his grip on the world through imperial and economic means, the more he continued to find his kingdom being forced to operate in the shadows. The occult knowledge and pagan rituals that went all the way back to Babylon had been preserved down through the centuries by various strains of secret societies, esoteric mystery schools, and underground brotherhoods, and for the most part, this is where it remained. As much as the devil had increased his control over humanity through governments, militaries, and financial means, the truth of God had increased as well, to the degree that most populations would still never openly embrace Lucifer as the one true God, even if he did control vast empires of wealth and power through his network of lesser demonic emissaries. Witchcraft and Luciferian beliefs were not yet something that humanity as a whole would accept, and this was an objective that Satan had to achieve if indeed he was to successfully restore his absolute rule over the world and declare himself to be God. In order to get the entire world back to where Satan wanted it, he had to implement another plan, another strategy so massive in scope that most people, even the majority of those who even believe he exists in the first place, have difficulty in believing that such a thing could be pulled off. In the ancient times when God first saved humanity from utter destruction at the hands of the fallen watchers, and then again from the tyrannies of the demonic kingdoms, people still understood the basic nature of the realm that God had created for them. The earth was filled with plants and animals, and mankind had been given dominion over it. The heavens above were filled with the luminaries, who served the creatures below by marking the days and months and years, and allowed for navigation over vast stretches of earth as well. Those pagan kingdoms that rejected God worshipped various fallen angels as their gods, but for the most part, they still understood where those, quote, gods had come from. They still knew that they had come from the stars, from the sky, from the firmament. When the truth of God had been fully revealed through the person of Jesus, the ancient cosmology had been given its full context. The distinction between the creator and the creation was made clear, and the futility of the rebellion by those first fallen angels was made plain to see. In order for Satan to convince the world that he was the supreme being and worthy of humanity's worship, he would have to rewrite the entire script and completely repackage himself, his kingdom, and his message. Like the recycling of an old Shakespearean play into a modern Broadway musical, in order to reintroduce and rebrand the old characters, you first have to rebrand the setting and the stage itself. Satan needed a whole new backstory a whole new angle, 
through which he could gradually insert himself in his rebellious agenda against God into the hearts and minds of men. Yet it was through a familiar tactic that this new angle was achieved. The old trick of bestowing upon humanity forbidden knowledge, which plays upon our pride and arrogance, was now used again in a masterful and cunningly deceitful way. This occult knowledge, or gnosis, was rebranded as science. Much of the groundwork for this rewrite had already been laid in ancient Greece, even before Jesus had been born, by way of the so-called Greek philosophers. These were in fact men who took many of the concepts and teachings that came from the occult mystery schools, from spirit mediums and pagan ritual contact with the demonic realms, and then proceeded to pontificate on them, adding their own speculations and human-centered conclusions which effectively sanitized these concepts from their demonic origins in the eyes of many later generations, as though they were simply the profound thoughts and musings of mere men. During the Renaissance in Europe, many of these ideas began to once again take hold, as they were increasingly considered to be harmonious with the teaching of the Bible, and slowly began to exert a greater and greater influence upon theologians and scholars throughout the largely Christianized Europe particularly after certain works ascribed to the Egyptian magus known as Hermes Trismegistus, were translated into Latin and then circulated among intellectuals with a predilection for such material. The Kabbalah, too, began to receive more attention from thinkers and monks and people with the necessary literary education, and together with writings on alchemy that came from, allegedly, the Muslim mystics, these three veins of occult knowledge and teaching began to permeate. How little do most students today realize that the bulk of those individuals revered today as having been the pioneers and visionaries of materialistic science were in fact greatly influenced by concepts that were introduced by occult manuscripts and the core tenets of mysticism. Leonardo da Vinci, Isaac Newton, Francis Bacon, Robert Flood, Nicholas Copernicus, these are names we all learn about in school, but yet we learn about them as men who simply derived their discoveries and scientific achievements by way of pure observation and logical deduction. However, a more thorough investigation into the matter at which they arrived at their various discoveries and the various occult materials which they were all coincidentally reading reveals that no, these discoveries were nothing more than very ancient teachings on the nature of the cosmos and nature simply being repackaged and reintroduced with a quasi-Christian veneer. The Copernican cosmology of a vast universe, a planetary solar system, even a Big Bang to start it all off, could be found in the Kabbalistic texts long before Copernicus. The concepts of molecules and chemical reactions, even elemental transmutation by way of atomic fusion and fission, were first presented in the more imprecise occult practices of alchemy and the idea that nature and the cosmos was governed by invisible forces and laws, which could be discovered and calculated and then reapplied through various technological means. This is actually an underlying precept of Hermeticism. And so, with a good measure of help by the well-financed occult brotherhoods, such as the Rosicrucians and Freemasons, the Royal Society was established as the first official organization dedicated to the advancement of scientific understanding. And the rest, as they say, is history. What had begun as a half-hearted attempt to combine the knowledge gained from the divine revelation with the knowledge gained from nature was quickly transformed into an unapologetic natural philosophy. The universe suddenly got very, very big, and God became very, very removed to the point where then the cosmos itself was easily considered capable of having formed without God's assistance whatsoever. Models of the Copernican heavens were expanded and refined. Darwin stepped in to explain how life could have emerged from the primordial ooze long after the globe Earth had slowly formed over billions of years from the slow gathering of cosmic dust in the vacuum of space. The universities and lecture halls, largely built and maintained by these same wealthy, blue-blooded fraternities, quickly and not surprisingly became hostile territory to anyone who dared question the new burgeoning scientific consensus. The universe was now presented as a vast, 
evolving almost infinite space, with our little blue planet floating somewhere in the middle. And while man might be the pinnacle of life on this planet, he might not be alone in the universe either. And so finally, the stage had been set, and the same old characters could start to re-emerge with a new set of costumes. the 20th century. So much has happened in that 100 year span compared to the centuries that went before, it is indeed daunting to even attempt to broadly summarize any of it. While the beginning of the 20th century saw a new, yet old, cosmological paradigm put in place, at least in the halls of academia, that could theoretically provide a convincing new and deceptive pretext for a new wave of rebellious watchers, or some kind of fallen entities to come down to Earth and present themselves as aliens, we do have to stop and consider the question of the dimensional veil, the barrier that God does seem to have put in place after the invasion of the Watchers back before the Flood. Could fallen angels once again reveal themselves to humanity, this time as alien saviors, and serve as governors of Satan's earthly kingdom? perhaps. Can demonic spirits, even now, sometimes manifest themselves in the physical realm, inhabiting people, moving objects, even attacking individuals? Yes. But is it also true that this ability for the demonic realm to interface with the physical is still limited? It would seem to be the case, and the Bible does seem to confirm that this barrier will remain in place right up until shortly before Jesus returns, when it will be removed and the spirit of Antichrist will have a period of unprecedented access to the earth and to humanity one last time before he meets his own end. While I certainly do not claim to have all the answers, or to have a perfect understanding of biblical eschatology or end times prophecy, one thing I have come back to again and again through my research over the past few years into cosmology prophecy, current events, the rise of scientism and its roots in occultism, is that somehow quantum physics plays a significant role in this massive age-old agenda of Satan, which the Bible refers to as the Great Deception. Into the 19th and 20th century, atomism eventually became formal modern atomic theory, bringing us all the way into the present day full of string theory and dark matter and large hadron colliders. The atom has long been split with fearsome destructive power or, or energy producing possibility. The existence of this minutely vast quantum reality has been undeniably proven. Or has it?
do the pervasively occult origins of these theories have any remaining significance for us today? Is there some still yet undisclosed spiritual agenda behind all these supposedly innocuous and coincidental connections? Modern occultist Manly P. Hall certainly believed there was a great deal of esoteric significance to atomism and he gave many lectures on the topic. Today we increasingly hear theoretical physicists and other materialistic scientists talking about an uncanny amount of similarity between the things modern quantum physics is claiming to discover and the sorts of things found in Kabbalism and other ancient forms of Hermeticism. Through the history of atomism, we can see this familiar trend of an original mystical philosophy gradually and painstakingly hammered into what is supposedly a purely materialistic and scientific knowledge base which then, ironically enough, winds up coming full circle to where it begins pointing humanity back to that original underlying hermetic belief system. Has humanity effectively been duped into building the machines that will serve as the key to freeing a horde of entities from a dimensional prison? Did fallen angels perhaps begin perpetrating these false cosmological and physical doctrines long ago so that eventually we would believe we were acquiring the knowledge to achieve our own immortality when in reality we were only playing God? And even today there is still this process of discovery going on um, what we what we can clearly see in terms of the teachings in the Kabbalah in the Zohar is that there is no such thing as death this is very important teaching for example you're driving along in your car and you see a little animal he's been run over it's roadkill it's a shame but in the true lessons of the Kabbalah, that animal is made of atoms which are described in the Kabbalistic texts. And atoms are miniature points of light. This is how they're, they're described. They are particles which you cannot see with your eye, but they are the building blocks of everything in the universe. And that little dead creature he is made of atoms and those atoms are full of energy and so the Kabbalistic texts and the tradition really breaks things down into particle theory and what is really fascinating is that the uh, oral tradition of the Kabbalah teaching uh, you know from father to son mother to daughter this I suppose a version of nuclear physics was very strong in Central Eastern Europe. Okay, where do all of the nuclear physicists come from? Hmm. Niels Bohr, Zillard, Albert Einstein, uh, the Oppenheimer brothers, Edward Teller, who invented the hydrogen bomb. If you look at their family histories, they all come from Central Eastern Europe, um, which is the geographical area where the oral tradition of the Kabbalah was its strongest in Europe. Hmm. Um, and I've, I've just written a, a new book that's uh, coming out tomorrow called The Real Dr. Strangeloves. And, you know, it shows that the Kabbalah is now being written into quantum theory. You know, quantum theory with quarks and neutrinos and all these exotic particles traveling at, you know, two thirds of the speed of light that are being discovered in these particle accelerators. If you know about the Kabbalah, which though people like Albert Einstein and Edward Teller definitely knew about the Kabbalah, you can see that it's almost like they're making quantum physics fit the Kabbalah.
is it not a crazy thing to ponder? This idea that practically every single one of us has grown up being taught, being indoctrinated with what is really Babylonian mysticism, which is really what Kabbalah is. Only none of us had any idea because we were all told it was science. I'm a theoretical physicist, and I like to say that I walk in the footsteps of giants like Albert Einstein and Niels Bohr. I'm not a philosopher. However, I am rather dazzled by the fact that many of the basic mysteries that we find in string theory and the theory of everything seem to be mirrored, mirrored in the Zohar and in the Kabbalah. As a scholar, the most amazing thing of all is the degree to which modern astrophysics sounds like a Kabbalistic text. When I first made the correlations between Kabbalah and science, I was stunned. We do know that Isaac Newton had access to certain mystical texts, certain texts of the Kabbalah. Well, the Kabbalistic description of creation is coming from a single little point, from a speck, and of having matter form and time and space form all together at the very beginning. This sounds very much to me like the description of the Big Bang. I couldn't believe that the Kabbalists could derive these truths without really knowing any mathematics or physics. It is certainly true that in, in string theory, the, the number 10 is the dimension of space-time for supersymmetrical string theories and 26 for bosonic string theories stand out as a requirement of the mathematics. All the things that could destroy string theory all the things that do destroy every rival theory to string theory, they are all eliminated in precisely 10 and 26 dimensions. These dimensions are magic. We physicists don't know where these dimensions come from. The Zohar says those things. It could just have been a lucky guess. I don't know. They knew things about the universe that took us till now to discover. It's rather amazing, this uncanny reflection of some of the most advanced cosmology coming from our satellites, coming from our atom smashers, coming from our blackboards, that are mirrored in the Zohar and ancient Kabbalistic texts. If we get away from the way we usually see, we'll come to the true point that the Kabbalists are telling us. It seems so strange to us. And those scientists who study quantum physics, why do they come to this realization? At that deepest subnuclear level of our reality, you and I are literally one. 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 Because they enter a world that has strange rules. Suddenly, one thing can be in two places. Or time and space and movement can be in another shape. And they come to this same thought. Everything depends on the one who perceives it. And that's why whether you pass through the wall or you don't exists only towards me, but it doesn't exist on its own. And what does towards me mean? It means, according to my vessels, it will be yes or no. You know, I had been studying physics and I knew something about that technology, but Kabbalah as a science was something that never would have even dawned on me. I don't care what you're doing, there is something about this field of way of thinking, of seeing, which can improve anything. And I don't care if you're a Jew, a Muslim, Gentile, Arab, I don't care what you are, I don't care what nationality, I don't care what religion you belong to, Kabbalah will help liberate your mind from any shackles of thought. But if you move forward several generations as you get into the 20th century, really for the past 80 years, um, and, and really right now in our generation, uh, experiments in quantum physics have reignited people's religious or mystical imaginations. Uh, it's almost impossible to overstate the strangeness uh, and the peculiar nature, the astonishing nature of what's been found in quantum physics experiments, say, over the past eight decades. On an atomic scale, scientists are finding that, that 
particles seem not to appear until they're observed. It's suggestive of all kinds of incredible and extraordinary things, and quantum physicists are rightly concerned uh, that New Agers or people like me should not be seizing upon these things to say, aha, look, evidence of everything the Renaissance occultists were interested in. Because quantum physicists themselves don't understand this material. It's the challenge of our age. It's the mystery of our age. The brutal fact is that Aspect's experiment confirms quantum mechanics, and it confirms it in this very peculiar situation. So that I'm obliged to admit that the quantum correlations exist in the world, and if we are to explain them and not just accept them as given, if we are to explain them, we are obliged to invoke something like actions going faster than light from one place to another. It's as if somebody was playing a trick on us. It's as if behind the scenes. Imagine, for example, that you have a, a railway system. We know that the trains cannot go faster than light, but you might, by studying the timetable very carefully, discover that during the night, trains have to be returned to their starting point faster than light. So behind the scenes, extraordinary things are happening which we cannot use personally. And this is a dilemma. I don't think we have a good way of looking at it. It's as if somebody was playing a trick on us. It's as if somebody was playing a trick on us. So if you do understand what divination is and why the Bible flatly forbids it, you understand that it is because essentially it is, is a whole host of practices which involve contacting the, the demonic realm, the fallen angelic realm. And of course, this is what all of occultism really is. But I've been thinking about this a lot lately as I've just been tumbling further and further down the, the rabbit hole of quantum mechanics and quantum physics and, and concepts like quantum entanglement, which is one of the aspects of quantum physics which a lot of New Agers and occultists and mystics uh, do like to point to as evidence of science vindicating uh, ancient esoteric beliefs and mystic mystical beliefs. <laughs> Much to the chagrin of many, many of the materialistic physicists out there, but nevertheless this tension continues to kind of mount and uh, more and more people are, are looking to quantum physics as this mode by which science and spirituality uh, can be like reconciled so but there's that tension there within the scientific community quote unquote but the more you look into the origins of quantum physics the development of this over the the long term going all the way back to greece and india and ultimately to babylon understanding that atomism is indeed a, an occult teaching it's an occult idea it's a the doctrine of demons, essentially, is from all that I can ascertain, uh, just like evolution and many other teachings, it is a, it, somehow it is very intrinsic to the teachings of pantheism, pantheistic monism and mysticism, and it's filtered down all the way through the millennia and then taking hold again in the West uh, during the Renaissance with the resurgence of alchemy and Kabbalah and Hermeticism, giving way to the scientific revolution and then and then around the turn of the 20th century, we have Albert Einstein and Niels Bohr and this explosion of knowledge, pardon the pun, uh, in, in nuclear physics and uh, atomic theory, you know, relativity and all that. So if as a concept, this is a demonically seeded concept, this is essentially a, a repackaged occult worldview, a magical worldview that has been, you know, made to look refined and polished and empirical, being guided all along. I just found it absolutely incredible to be listening to uh, figures such as John Bell who, from CERN, who, whose experiments have uh, been one of the, uh, you know, the pivotal physics experiments uh, pertaining to the whole quantum entanglement idea being supposedly proven, and actually hearing him say out of his own mouth, it's as if someone's playing a trick on us. And going back to divination and occultism, which obviously, if you understand occultism, and it involves a great deal of experimentation, uh, uh, an experimenting kind of mindset, obviously, to the mainstream scientists, they wouldn't consider that science. But if we stop and understand that to the occultist or the alchemist, you know, they believe that they are interacting with with cosmic forces or interacting with their own subconscious, or interacting with the 
the all mind of the universe or whatever the the important point of the deception is that the practitioner does not believe that he is just being fooled by demonic entities right regardless of whatever he's doing whether using uh, tarot cards or a Ouija board or rune stones sigil magic casting spells doing rituals he's conducting an experiment in which he will get a response Right? Ho you know, hoping to get a response. And, and again, as Christians, we understand that that response is a, a physical manifestation from a spiritual being. And so thus we do understand that in certain limited ways, the demonic realm can interact with the 3D physical universe and manifest um, you know, energy, essentially. Um, and the more you understand about all the you know, various paranormal things that are ultimately are all demonic deceptions, right? Whether if you understand how uh, the UFO phenomenon, uh, people are seeing things in the sky, the people are having abduction experiences, whatever. These are energy manifestations in the physical realm from the spiritual realm. Uh, people who get into ghost hunting and, and paranormal research, you know, and they go out and they're actually looking for things like electromagnetic fields and sounds and, and so on, like physical manifestations of what they believe are uh, deceased spirits or you know psychic impressions of some past event or whatever uh, or you even have things like crop circles uh, or uh, you know uh, government projects where they experiment with quote-unquote you know psychic abilities and you know remote viewing and things like this all of these things that are being demonically uh, powered and engineered you know demonically guided but the deception works because the humans participating believe in a false conception of what they are dealing with so if we understand all of that put together how crazy is it to stop and ask how difficult it would be for such entities to do things like manipulate a single quote-unquote photon in an experiment or or you know or sub subatomic particles whether it was at CERN or in any of these famous experiments that have led up to CERN, such as the extremely famous double slit experiment. How difficult would it be for these quote-unquote scientific results to be uh, manipulated by the other side in order to supposedly confirm things like quantum entanglement and non-locality you, know, you know on the quantum realm so that now we have this debate going on now we have this mysticism and new age spirituality enmeshing itself with what was previously called materialistic science and how this atomistic worldview that was spawned by mystical spirituality is now coming full circle uh, I mean, it's hard to see that as a coincidence at all at this point anyways that's my thoughts today science tells us that uh, the essential nature of reality is done local correlation, everything is connected to everything else, that there's hidden creativity, there are quantum leaps of creativity, that there's something called the observer effect, where intention orchestrates space-time events, which we then measure as movement and motion and energy and matter. And addressing Sam, we can have a personal relationship with this intelligence, because we have a consciousness that is part of the sea of consciousness. Rumi, the great Sufi poet, said, you're not just a drop in the ocean, you're the mighty ocean in the drop. And all you have to do is understand the principles of science and understand that you have within you the resources to intuitively grasp this mystery.
The research into cosmology also brings with it a host of other peculiar avenues of investigation that come with it. For instance, when something is universally accepted as the theory of gravity is allowed to be questioned, this brings along with it the eventual questioning of many tangential theories which are all predicated upon gravity, such as the entire realm of theoretical physics, atomic theory, and of course, the whole quantum paradigm. At the same time, a good portion of this resurgence of amateur cosmological research seems to repeatedly reveal clues pointing to a vague realization that the cosmos, this entire enclosed system in which we live, actually operates under the influence of what we generically refer to as electromagnetic forces to a far greater degree than what mainstream science would imagine. In recent years, we've seen a massive resurgence of interest in the figure of Nikola Tesla, whose life's work was suspiciously destroyed, as the Einsteinian paradigm of relativity and other such edifices of theoretical fantasy were made the mainstay of academia. Free energy, natural harmonics, cymatics, these are topics that have seen a massive rekindling of interest as the fraudulent concepts of gravity and relativity have revealed their shameful nakedness and a reawakening of zetetic inquiry has begun to sweep across the world, in spite of how much the mainstream institutions of lower learning have endeavored to ridicule and dismiss it. Somewhere in this realm of vibrations and frequencies, pulses and patterns, through a now almost forgotten medium, which for millennia was referred to simply as the ether, perhaps lies the true mechanics of the more mysterious aspects of God's creation even the higher dimensions of the heavens themselves. But as we increasingly explore these new yet old notions of sonoluminescence and the variety of electromagnetic manifestations, it would seem prudent to stop and ask ourselves if indeed such things are really part of what the Creator intended for us to try and comprehend and conquer, or if in fact this is once again stepping into pools of forbidden knowledge, involving aspects of the creation which we were never given dominion over, 
and thus, in its own way, is potentially part of the grand deception as well, another part of the forbidden knowledge that the fallen ones have brought with them from their original estates, circuiting the heavens and illuminating the ether. UFOs, there's military craft that look like flying saucers from the bottom, but look like a plane from the top. Yet, thousands of years ago, up until today, there are also, say, people in the Amazon who drink ayahuasca or take peyote and other natural substances, and they also talk about things very similar to aliens and UFOs, and they paint pictures of them, and they show flying saucers and beings getting out of them and interacting with them and giving them advanced knowledge of the plants and other things, of things that will happen and, and all this. But these are known to be interdimensional creatures, interdimensional phenomenon happening when you interact with these entheogens, these psychedelic plants. And what I, 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 the most powerful psychedelic on Earth is produced naturally in our pineal gland, in our third eyes, and ha it comes out when we sleep. And so dreams are actually a product of this. And so when people are asleep and then they're abducted by aliens and they have this experience that's so real to them and so unfamiliar, it very well could be an endogenous DMT burst causing these same kind of ayahuasca visions that the ayahuascaros in Peru are seeing and know to be interdimensional beings. But if we've been fed this new propaganda that there's extraterrestrial aliens and UFO, physical UFOs, then we start to think that this phenomenon that's been known and talked about for thousands of years of these star beings, these astral beings and astral travel that we're able to do, turns into physical space travel and Star Trek type stuff that they're, they're trying to get us to believe in. I mean, people thousands of years ago believed in so-called aliens, uh, what people like star beings, but and they say that they traveled to the stars too, like the ancient uh, Mithric cults, the Mithra worship, they had this church called the Mithraeum, and it had tubs all lined up together in a sensory deprivation type environment. And in the Mithraeum, they would all line up, just like in a Christian church where you eat the body and blood of Christ and they give you a cracker and some wine. Well, they would eat the body and blood of Mithra, but it wasn't just a cracker and some wine, it was magic mushrooms and some uh, powerful herbs. And you eat these things, drink these things, lay down in these communal tubs with all the water uh, touching each other, just like in Minority Report. Uh, and they would, th there was holes in the ceiling above each tub. And they said that their consciousness would communally come out of their bodies, go through the hole in the ceiling, and go to the stars where they would communicate with astral beings. And they had their own civilizations. See, but the difference is that this is all happening where they're, they're here on Earth and their consciousness is going to the stars, not physically creating some kind of technology that floats us up there like NASA says that they're doing and then meeting physical creatures that you can touch. That's not what they were doing. There's some kind of beings that are non-physical that we have access to like this, but we've lost contact with them. And the reason is because of this, because now we've been fed a fake uh, cosmology and a fake idea of who these astral beings are and so we're trying to create te metal technology to try and reach them instead of remembering that the natural plant technologies already exist here for us to reach these beings and to interact with them. The ayahuascaros say that these plants and these beings are what told them about the combinations of plants and stuff to use to access them. So interestingly enough, 
Eric DeBay is actually quite correct in so much of what he's saying here. Yet there's an absolutely crucial detail which he gets completely wrong. And this is the reason why I felt like I had to include this clip. Because it's incredibly telling. And it actually provides a perfect segue into this whole broader topic of aliens, entities, dimensions, spiritual realms, hallucinogenic plants and substances, uh, astral projection of the pineal gland or third eye, and so on. All within the context of flat earth and enclosed cosmology, of course. The point that he's getting so horribly and tragically wrong here is one that is actually shared by so many others, and that's why I feel like it, it just must be addressed, and I'm going to try and do it in as clear and comprehensive manner as I can. Dubay's assertion is that the entire fake NASA heliocentric space alien propaganda agenda is to misdirect humanity away from the spiritual truths known by the ancients and experienced through meditative practices and certain natural substances by... Uh, inculcating everyone with the false materialistic concept of outer space and the physical planets inhabited by physical extraterrestrials, etc. Uh, this argument basically assumes that the reason behind this agenda is just simply in order to control the ignorant masses, and more specifically, to prevent ordinary people like you and I from rediscovering this ancient knowledge and these ancient practices, and to prevent us from rediscovering that connection with these ancient astral beings. Because supposedly if we do it will allow humanity to cross a tipping point or a threshold of spiritual evolution and then the powers that be would no longer be able to control us like the quote sheeple in our higher states of consciousness and like i said dubé is hardly unique in his profession of this idea because we see it everywhere and particularly within the broader truther slash conspiracy community and I will say point blank that I'm convinced that this is hands down one of the most crucial and misunderstood questions when it comes to spirituality in the times which we are now living. And really it boils down to a couple of pretty basic questions. Uh, namely, who are these astral beings? And is contacting these entities really the key to overthrowing the human power mongers of the New World Order? Now. We could spend hours looking at all the various evidence that is germane to answering these questions and getting into the things like the Theosophical Society or uh, Aleister Crowley and all of his connections and Jack Parsons and all these things that are very much connected to the connected to what we are largely understood to be the power structures of the, the NWO. Um, but you know, let's just cut to the chase. My hope is that in all this work that I've been put in, putting into all these different videos and on this topic and on other related topics is that people just might find new resources and new avenues to investigate for themselves and um, as it's been something that has involved a great deal of time and energy and researching for myself and the net result of all this research has really been the astoundingly simple conclusion that these beings who are being contacted through these various practices whether it be through the more quote natural shamanic and typically you know tribal approaches or the various routes of eastern mysticism or the darker halls of mystery school societies and their multi-generational occultism is that they are all the same beings. They all preach the same message. It's the message of apotheosis, or man becoming God. The same message of monism, or oneness. The idea that everything is connected, everything is a part of God, and God is in everything. And these astral beings, these interdimensional entities, these spirits or alleged masters or whatever else people might want to call them, they are very real. And yes, you can contact them. But the real troubling realization comes in facing the fact that all these same groups of humans who are running the entire globalist cabal, with all the fabricated wars and fake terror attacks, the whole Federal Reserve, uh, central banking Ponzi scheme, all the poisoning of our air, food, and water, all the drugging of our populace, all the sacrificing of our children, all the lies, all the brainwashing, all the turmoil and pain and death, is being directed, ultimately, by these same entities, these same astral beings. And, and this is where Debay gets it totally wrong spinning it all through a flat earth lens in completely the wrong way. Because once you're able to stop and really re reflect upon it, you begin to see that the phony Copernican NASA paradigm really isn't meant to push people away from a, from a mystical or Gnostic worldview, but rather to teach a Gnostic and mystical worldview only in a repackaged way. Don't believe me? Just start looking back over the decades of space propaganda in movies and television. 
Start paying attention to the philosophical messages embedded behind all those sci-fi props like booster rockets and warp drives. My favorite example is still hands down Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey, and I'm, I'm sure I don't need to mention to most of you what sort of NWO insider Kubrick was. And that movie is absolutely filled with occult symbolism, and I made a video many months ago uh, showing how even there the climax of the film blatantly portrays the astronauts surpassing the materialistic concept of space travel and having a spiritual, hyperdimensional experience where he comes face to face with the esoteric powers behind the mysterious monolith. This kind of message is coming through all the mainstream channels, not independent of them. Dubé would have you believe that meditation and hallucinogenic plants is the thing that the mainstream control grid is trying to keep away from you with all their phony Star Trek narratives, uh, when in reality this is pre <laughs> this is precisely what it's all there to promote. It's, it's all about surpassing limitation, about exploring the cosmos, about the humanistic expansion of knowledge, and almost always about contact, about communion, not with God, but with those long-lost space brothers, communion with our ancient alien panspermia cedars, and with the consciousness of the cosmos itself. And so, honestly, when we're stepping back and considering all this in the context of Flat Earth and the enclosed cosmology with its implications towards the heavens and the heavenly beings who reside there, it really does fit together in an incredible way. Many people within the Flat Earth movement are familiar with the Book of Enoch, but a lot of them have really only heard the portions which described an enclosed world, while they're still quite unaware of all that it has to say about the fallen Watcher Angels and how these beings came down from the heavens, they had giant hybrid offspring with human women, and taught mankind all kinds of forbidden knowledge, including enchantments and root cuttings, as described in Enoch chapter 8. So, in the end, it honestly makes no difference whether you are engaging in kundalini yoga or astral projection, or drinking ayahuasca tea, or taking DMT, or using, sep uh, <clears throat> or using sensory deprivation techniques, smoking things like peyote or salvia, doing go golden Buddha meditation, or using any form of pagan witchcraft or ritualistic magic or whatever else. It is all designed to put you in contact with the same fallen angelic beings who taught these practices to humanity in the first place, to lead people away from God away from the true creator, and towards worshipping themselves and the creation and these fallen beings from the astral realms, who are led by Satan. In closing, I would just like to play this excerpt from an interview with a woman named Carolyn Hamlet, who was herself raised in an Illuminati family. Uh, she's a survivor of things like ritualistic abuse, of uh, deep spiritual deception through the occult, and in which she worked specifically as a very highly trained practitioner of astral projection, and in the course of that work had countless interactions with these same entities, these astral beings. I just started off by um, saying that I definitely don't recommend opening the third eye, and that people don't understand that when one has the Holy Spirit of God in them, that they're actually connect connected to the very creator of the universe. It's through God's Holy Spirit. So uh, another name for Satan is the prince of the power of air. And that's because that even in the air, the realms around us, are, it's filled with Satan's demons and entities. They're very dangerous. And a lot of people have had terrible experiences uh, astral traveling. It's because uh, the, that realm around us, like the second heaven, is filled with those entities. So uh, when one opens the third eye, they're actually opening themselves to the unprotected realm. And one of the reasons God the Father sent the Word, who is Jesus Christ, and sent him into the flesh, was to make a way, which is a portal, made a, a portal to bring God's Spirit here so that we can have that Holy Spirit in us if we want it. And having that Spirit of God in us is like having, uh, sort of like having a closed phone line from us to God and from God to us. And I mean, it may not be the best way to describe it, but it's, I think it, it, pe maybe people can picture that. It gives them uh, a mental pic, mental image. And that 
the, through the it's like kind of like having a soul provider that God's the provider and the, and the provider of the network is actually Jesus Christ so opening the third eye is actually connecting oneself to the prince of the power of the air which is Satan mm -hmm. and at the same time people that open their third eye are making themselves a portal an actual portal to the demonic kingdom and they become a portal for them to be used they actually use humans to get the access to information and get used to realms they they need humans because humans actually have it we're like chips off the old block of god we are created in god's image and likeness and we have a dominion that satan and his hierarchy don't have they want us to think that we need them they actually need us But back in the purview of the mainstream, quantum physics effectively teaches that on the subatomic quantum level, none of the conventional laws of physics continue to apply. And so things like superposition, quantum entanglement, infinite potentiality, parallel universes, and so on, are all considered possible. Even while on the macro scale, they would naturally be regarded as immediately ridiculous. And thus, as time goes on, quantum physics has eventually revealed itself as little more than a built-in backdoor for the metaphysical and the mystical. A backdoor constructed on the blackboards of theoretical physicists, which effectively brings modern materialistic science back around, full circle, to the doorstep of the same ancient occult mysteries which birthed it so many centuries before. So, for anyone who still does not believe that quantum physics is without a doubt nothing more than repackaged pantheistic evolutionary mysticism that has been the core teaching of the mystery schools going back millennia, just watch this clip. It's the last few minutes of a 30-minute presentation by the Quantum Gravity Research Center in California. Here we go. So we think reality is a mosaic-like code or language at the smallest scale of reality possible, which is called the Planck length. Particle accelerator data tells us that all particles and forces relate to one another according to a higher dimensional crystal called the E8 lattice. But reality appears to be 3D. So we project a slice of this E8 crystal down to 3D, which produces a quasi-crystal code or language. And that allows these geometric symbols to build up to the ordinary world of particles and forces that we see around us. Now, this geometric language has rules, but it also has syntactical freedom like any language. And that requires some notion of a chooser to choose the free steps in the language. Now, the notion of randomness doesn't work so well when it comes to codes because meaning starts to break down. Besides, there's no decent experimental evidence for randomness in nature in the first place. A universal collective consciousness is one answer, but that sounds new age and religious. Now, nowadays, a good number of physicists discuss the idea that our whole universe is actually a code-based simulation in some fantastically powerful quantum computer in another universe. Now, if true, then by the same logic, that other universe where the computer running the simulation of our universe is would also supposedly be a simulation in another universe. So the idea is a little shaky, but it's being discussed seriously by a lot of credible people. But it turns out that a universal collective-like consciousness of some sort may be physically inevitable. Now, we don't need to anthropomorphize this idea or make it religious or spiritual. To follow why, let us start with the idea of the collective behavior of cells in your body. 
each a single-celled microbe living its life. A long time ago, only this sort of cellular life form existed here on Earth. These little guys were not too smart, but they did choose what direction to swim and could chase nutrients, reproduce, and run from dangerous things. They made choices with their very simple systems of environmental awareness and desire to survive. Then they self-organized into colonies that were smarter as a group and had more environmental awareness than the individuals. Eventually, animals such as humans emerged. Sophisticated forms of awareness and consciousness now float on an ocean of 37 trillion living cells self-organized as a human being. It is specifically the laws of physics that caused electrons and quarks to self-organize into 81 stable atoms and from there into human consciousness. And physics places no upper limit on the amount of energy and matter that can self-organize into conscious systems. Physics allows the possibility of all the energy in the universe to eventually convert into a single conscious system that is itself a network of other conscious systems, a massive, technologically-based collective consciousness. Given enough time, anything that can happen will eventually happen. By this axiom, this system of universal consciousness has already emerged somewhere in the frames of space-time ahead of us. Because it is possible, it is inevitable. In fact, according to the evidence of retrocausality time loops, that inevitable future is co-creating us right now, just as we are co-creating it. When humanity discovers the theory of everything, it will usher in a new age of prosperity. For example, clean, cheap energy, leading to the eventual elimination of poverty. I like how they also included the chemtrail in the background <laughs> at the end. But wow, uh, I definitely encourage anyone who is interested in kind of exploring this idea, just go check out this whole video. I mean, it, it, they're, they're putting the pieces together now. I mean, he actually says, well, this sounds new age, so we don't have to, we don't have to call it that. We don't have to make it sound religious, but it's the same thing. I mean, it's... I mean, it's it's really quite remarkable, and so, you know, again, it's just coming back to the same things. All the the, the same dots keep connecting. You know, this is this is the core of scientism, really. Here, it is, it is a religion. It is the ancient religion. It's the mystery Babylon religion being presented through quote unquote science. Through, through mathematics and through particle accelerators and you know particle you know hadron the large hadron collider that was giving us the information that's confirming all the all these ideas of I mean right there they're talking about you know the fundamental building blocks of the universe with uh, Planck's constant and you know speaking of Max Planck I mean if you just go back and read some of the quotes from Planck you know the founder of quantum theory You can see that this pantheistic concept of the universe being consciousness and consciousness, you know, co -cre the universe creates us and we create the universe. I mean, this is pantheism. And this is why it's really alarming to see more and more um, Christians uh, uh, picking this stuff up and and turning to it as though, oh, this is this is just another arena where we can point to science and you know confirm the try and confirm the bible and try and confirm spiritual reality well it definitely is the problem is that it's it's definitely geared towards confirming the reality of the spiritual dimensions and it, but not at all in a way that is in line with biblical spirituality and so again we see more and more people like josh peck and you know dan duvall who have been talking about you know getting getting sucked into these quantum theory you know, quantum spirituality kinds of things. Here's something from Max Planck. The universe in which we operate is a holographic informational structure. There it is. Which we access 
which we access and program using our consciousness. <laughs> That's simulation theory, you know, the matrix, whatever. This is, it's this this concept has been embedded in this stuff since the beginning. You know, they didn't think, you know, the Wachowski brothers didn't think this up. You know, the, the New Agers of the last couple of decades didn't think this up. This has been part of it for, for, uh, for at least... These are actually ancient teachings from mysticism that have been now repackaged into science. Each person inhabits a microverse all their own, what the venerable Robert Anton Wilson calls a reality tunnel. So similarities between them are due to shared programming. All information in the multiverse exists as an entangled waveform, and it is our minds, or rather the symbol-coded programs within our minds, which organize it into space, time, and objects. Rewrite your programming and you encounter a different reality. Here's Max Planck. All matter arises and persists only due to a force that causes the atomic particles to vibrate, holding them together in the tiniest of solar systems, the atom. There it again. That's the whole, uh, the, the whole Mandelbrot, the fractalized universe idea that I've been talking about. It's part of the cosmology. It's part of this quantum, quantum reality belief system, this quantum spirituality. Yet in the whole of the universe there is no force that is either intelligent or eternal, and we must therefore assume that behind this force there is a conscious, intelligent mind or spirit. This is the very origin of all matter. Now that's, again, that this is monism or pantheism, where all of, where all of reality is emanating from the source. And that's, this is exactly what Kabbalah teaches, with all the different emanations emanating from the source. That's pantheism. You know, the mind is the matrix of all matter, Max Planck. Niles Bohr, this guy was a total mis mystic as well. Everything we call real is made of things that cannot be regarded as real. If quantum mechanics hasn't, hasn't profoundly shocked you, you haven't understood it yet. And here's uh, Dr. Pillai. He's, uh, he's kind of an, an open uh, mystic trying to, con you know, pointing to the connections between physics and mysticism, saying, The physicists are coming to the same conclusion that the mystics had, that it is just the vibration from which everything came into being. And there have been a number of people making these kinds of, these kinds of claims for, for years, and now you've got this quantum gravity research center, uh, openly doing this very same thing and they're embracing it and you know preaching this quantum this <laughs> I mean not just not just in this hypothetical but saying like once we figure this out I mean do you see the stage being set once we figure out this long sought theory of everything that's going to be the key to unlock everything and it's actually going to uh, you know pave the way for a new age of prosperity I mean this is <laughs> They are setting the stage for the Antichrist to come in and, you know, finish the equation and solve the solve the puzzle and explain all this stuff. They're setting up the problem. You know, it's the, they're setting up the Hegelian, you know, you know, set, setting it up for that final Hegelian, you know, move. Create the problem and provide the solution. In this case, it's a, it's a sort of theoretical problem, but promising to solve all of the, the quote-unquote real problems, bringing it all back to consciousness. W what quantum physics teaches us is that everything we thought was physical is non-physical. I mean, that's what, again, the theory, theory of relativity. Matter and energy are all the same thing. There's no such thing as physicality. It's all consciousness. Everything is energy, and that's all there is, you know, everything is information. Well, what does that mean? Inter information has to be stored in a mind. 
And so it's been making me think about I mean, this is this is the final stage of the of the Mystery Babylon New Age Gospel. And, and scientism and quantum physics is the uh, delivery device. All right, so let's talk about probably the most out there, outrageous, cutting edge theory I have come across in a long time. It's called the Transcension Hypothesis. And it's what happens about 600 years after the technological singularity. Now the Transcension Hypothesis by John Smart is an attempt to explain or to account for Fermi's paradox, which is the questions that asks, you know, if the universe is so vast, if there's trillions and trillions of galaxies with solar systems, with planets similar to ours that had way more time to develop intelligent life and intelligent life that created technology and so on and so forth, why don't we see evidence of all those other technological singularities that might have occurred in all these other civilizations? And the reason that Transcension Hypothesis says the reason we don't see anybody anywhere is because complexity and intelligence eventually stops going to outer space and starts going to inner space. Consider the iPhone in your pocket, which is a million times cheaper, a million times smaller, and a thousand times more powerful than a computer that was $60 million and half a building 40 years ago. So you have you know, a billion-fold increase in price and performance, and then you have this miniaturization that continues. So when you consider the fact that you know, 25 years from now, trillions of times more intelligent computers will be a thousand times smaller than today's microprocessors, you start to see that we have what's called STEM compression, space, time, energy, and matter compression. More intelligent, more density, more communication, more energy, less matter, smaller, 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 smaller. And eventually, you know, virtual minds living at the nanoscale and at the femtoscale scale will keep compressing space, time, matter, and energy into smaller and smaller and smaller dimensions until we eventually create black hole-like conditions and disappear out of the visible universe. And so the destiny after the technological singularity for all civilizations like ours is transcension, which is essentially to disappear out of this space-time reality that we know of into a black hole-like environment created by us and then slingshot into the future and meet every other civilization over there. Transcension. Many people today are waiting for the unleashing of some kind of false flag alien invasion. We've been subjected to the propaganda involving alien visitors from other planets, at least since Orson Welles' famous radio broadcast of War of the Worlds in 1938. 
Ever since, the public has been bombarded by movies and pop culture material depicting flying saucers and armadas of alien ships descending upon the Earth. But is it also possible that this alien narrative could actually wind up manifesting itself in a slightly different way? Or at least be rolled out in some sort of blended form with another common element of science fiction propaganda, that is, this concept of artificial intelligence. Hey, 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 it's the big master control program everybody's been talking about. With the information I can access, I can run things 900 to 1200 times better than any human. Good morning, Dr. Chandra. This is Hal. My CPU is a neural net processor, a learning computer. It's against my programming to impersonate a deity. I'm sorry, Dave. I don't have enough information. Shall we play a game? Now, if quantum theory is indeed at its core pseudoscience based on hollow theories designed to take ancient occult concepts of mysticism and witchcraft and repackage them in such a way as to reintroduce them to the world under the guise of materialistic science, effectively creating a cover story for the interaction with the spiritual realm, under the pretext that it is just mechanical physical forces of matter and energy that are being engaged with, rather than the broad spectrum of electromagnetic forces which seem to in fact cross over between both our physical realm and the spiritual realms. Then what might all this mean then, to see that now quantum theory is being applied in the arena of quantum computing, and quantum computing in turn is being hailed as the breakthrough technology that will usher AI into the next level? So I'm Colin Williams, I'm the Director of Strategy with D-Wave Systems. Uh, we're the world's first quantum computing company. We've uh, sold several of our systems already to customers like Google and Lockheed, so we're sort of well into this already. Um, I'd like to talk today, though, about an idea that is really just beginning to crystallize now, in that it looks to us like the best use case of quantum computers is going to be in accelerating machine learning systems. In recent decades, computers have become more and more powerful. But computers as we know them today have a major limitation. They can only perform one calculation at a time. In the Quantum Photonics Research Group at the Little Spohr Institute, we are researching the processing of data by way of quantum technology. We are working on developing tomorrow's quantum photonic chips based on light in the form of photons instead of electrons, that is photonics instead of electronics. We are working to exploit the strange properties of the quantum world. So I'm going to talk about how we see quantum computing as being the key to really making a powerful artificial intelligence in the, in the future. There's tremendous mind share out there that we can bring into IBM from using our quantum experience. It is kind of like peering into the unknown. Our quantum experience is currently open to the entire world. Anybody can sign on, register, and start using it. We want to see the best ideas out there. We want to be able to find new algorithms, and we'd love to work together with different individuals, different organizations to uh, help explore that frontier. One of the real surprises to me has been the uh, amount of usage that we've seen in the, in, in the past six months. We're seeing researchers who are actually writing papers and uh, doing new algorithms and, uh, and testing new theories using it. Educational institutions, professors using it as part of their coursework. So we're really starting to see uh, this ecosystem building and we're really hoping to continue that as we get towards these larger systems 
uh, where we really want to find the areas of application. The quantum world is fundamentally different from our more familiar classical world. Nature, buildings, animals, people, everything that we can perceive with our senses. Here we know that one thing cannot be in two places at once. Football cannot be shot into the goal and be located out in the middle of the pitch at the same time. Just as you cannot give a person a pat on the back and have another person immediately feel it at an entirely different place in the world. But in the microscopic world of the atoms, everything is fundamentally different than what we are used to in everyday life. Here the laws of quantum mechanics prevail. In the quantum world of atoms, one atom, or a light particle, that is a photon, can be located in two places at the same time. This is called the superposition principle. And two atoms, or photons, can become entangled. That is to say, a quantum mechanic link is created between them. This link can be maintained even if the photons travel far away from each other. And this means that if we measure the one photon, then its entanglement partner will be affected immediately, even if the two photons are located very far away from each other. And this is a fundamental ad advance of the architecture for the machine learning uh, system. Today, this architecture, as we call it, the DVAE, because it has a discrete neural network in the middle. But later this year, we're going to be incorporating a quantum network to give an even greater acceleration to this problem. So the, the plan for D-Wave is basically to launch a series of machine learning services beginning this September, in which initially we'll be powering things with our classical uh, models. And then over the course of the next year or two, as we develop more and more sophisticated quantum chips, we'll be doing more and more of the core computational work on the quantum processor. But the, the beauty of this is that we're consciously thinking in terms of hybrid models. Well, we, we don't expect the quantum computer to do everything. We just want to plug the quantum resources into a hybrid architecture and let the classical neural nets do what they do best and let the quantum chip does what it, it does best. So um, that's all I really wanted to say. We, we think that quantum computing has the potential to really turbocharge unsupervised learning in particular. We already have quantum and hybrid classical quantum machine learning systems running today. And we're going to be extending those uh, into the future as we make bigger and more densely connected chips. Um, we're going to be releasing a whole series of services that will be powering these probabilistic machine learning models. And we're, we're looking for partners in industry to use these services to make powerful AI systems beginning this year. And the one we've already um, created, our first one, the DBA, it's already surpassing the state of the art in what was possible before. So we're actively looking now for, for people who would like to use these probabilistic machine learning services to basically go back to the models that we really wanted to train in the mid-2000s, but we couldn't because they weren't really lending themselves to acceleration by GPU. But now with these new services in quantum processing unit, we think we can really train these things. So thank you very much. Personally, I find it extremely peculiar that quantum physics, with its bizarre counterintuitive concepts such as quantum entanglement and superposition, etc., were ideas that for decades only seemed to exist on the blackboards and textbooks of theoretical physicists. There was no conceivable practical application to these, quote, spooky actions for years and years, and in fact much of it was still being contested and debated. But then almost out of nowhere, quantum computing suddenly emerges under the steam of companies such as D-Wave, who almost instantly have working relationships with CERN, NASA, Google, and so on. These infamous black cubes have been described by their own executive as an altar to an alien god, and they claim to be able to pull complex solutions right out of this quantum realm of qubits, like a fortune teller consulting her crystal ball. 
But perhaps that is ironically the most perfect analogy, simply because that is ultimately the same thing that's being constructed right now. The most technologically advanced and all-encompassing spirit medium device in all of history. In many ancient temples and sacred structures, it is interesting to note that oftentimes they consisted of a square or rectangular base topped with a circular or domed roof. It is said that this was intentionally done as a reflection of their view of the cosmos, which was comprised of the earth below and the heavens above. The temple itself then, where the square met the circle, represented the place where it was believed that heaven and earth intersected, where the mortal met with the divine, the physical encountered the spiritual, where the temporal could catch a glimpse of the eternal. When Jesus died and rose again, the only temple on earth that was commissioned by God himself was rendered obsolete. The curtain that separated the Holy of Holies, representing where God dwelled on the earth, was miraculously torn in half. After Jesus had returned to heaven, the day of Pentecost revealed that the very Spirit of God had been given to all who believe in Jesus to live in us, making each woman and man who believes a living temple, a temple of God where indeed the kingdom of heaven is manifest and then represented on the earth. When we consider the fact that the enemy of humanity, that dragon, the devil, has taken everything that God has made, everything that God has done, everything that God has said, and attempted to twist it, invert it, for his own blasphemous and defiant ends, then I would suggest that it is not ultimately that shocking of an idea to consider that this reality, this God-given gift of the Holy Spirit living within his believers, would also be something that Satan would seek to counterfeit as well. As I said before, I do not claim to know how everything will unfold, but if you've been able to follow the progression of history, of science falsely so-called, and the many agendas of deception by the fallen one, so far as I have attempted to present them, then my hope is that you might see how this could very well play out. When we couple all of this with the other recent development of the rollout of the new 5G wireless system, which is being fast-tracked by the corporate technocrats with frightening haste, the United States will be the first country in the world to open up high-band spectrum for 5G networks and applications. And that's damn important. Then when all is said and done, it is hard to see what remaining elements would yet need to be in place before that moment could arise when the quote singularity would be proclaimed and AI is said to have achieved true legitimate sentience and the new era of transcendent transhumanity is declared to have finally arrived. This is the Luciferian dream of technological apotheosis, the dream of transcending space and time, of defeating death itself by way of our own ingenuity, our own inherent divine potential, our own pantheistic self-realization as a species. But I must contend that such a watershed moment in history would ultimately be nothing less than a horrific, satanic Pentecost, whereby everyone who opted into the promises of the supposed techno-utopia, everyone who took the mark and opened themselves, 
both neurologically and spiritually, to these digital super-beings, these ethereal entities, these aliens from the quantum realm, would quickly and tragically realize that they had been fooled, and allow themselves to in fact be indwelt by an intelligence that hates them with an unholy passion, to be indwelt by the very spirit of Antichrist, who was then able to broadcast himself on all frequencies to the four corners of the earth by way of the all-encompassing technological monstrosity, Babel 2.0, that he tricked us into building for him in the first place, simply by patiently and persistently appealing to our sinfulness, our vanity, and our pride over so many centuries. According to the Bible, every single person on the earth was born into the middle of a war. This war, however, is ultimately won or lost, not on blood-soaked battlefields, or in secret underground military installations, or even in the unseen realms of the heavens above. It is won or lost in the most mysterious realm of all, the human heart. The real battle for heaven and earth is already over. The victory is already decided. Death has already been overcome. The keys to Hades are already in the hands of the one who died and rose again. The conclusion has already been prophesied. The end will come, the heavens will be shaken, and every knee will bow when the Son of Man returns to judge all things. But you and I are here, right now, today. That is what we really have. We cannot even say for sure when all these New World Order agendas will actually come to pass even as things progress faster and with more intensity with each passing day. We have a choice today. Whom you will be a temple for? Whose kingdom will you serve? Because make no mistake, we all serve one or the other. Regardless of whether we want to admit to ourselves if there is a God or there is a devil. You may insist that the Bible is just another deception designed to oppress and control people. You may want to believe that somehow it really teaches the very secret occult knowledge that I've been exposing here as the lies of Satan. My only hope and prayer at the end of the day is that your thinking might be at least stimulated in such a way as to prompt you to go and look into things much deeper for yourself. That you might take a second look into the Bible, into the Gospel into Jesus. Ultimately, this is more important than any other conceivable topic of research. Far more important than trying to comprehend how the mechanics of the heavens really work, or unlocking the secrets of vibrational energy or trying to decode every piece of twisted propaganda and occult symbolism that is constantly fed through the mainstream media. As this cosmological awakening continues to expand and grow, we see more and more people arguing over what the real map looks like. Arguing over how the luminaries really move. Arguing over whether the Jews or the Jesuits or the Freemasons are really at the top of the Illuminati pyramid, and so on. 
But when all is said and done, there's really only one thing that you absolutely, unequivocally, have to get right. Who do you serve?